Well, welcome to the Ramdas and Alan Watts live stream as we discuss the Dharma of these two amazing way showers of our time. It's really lovely to be together here in this sacred community. Um, and we gather like this to sort of share wisdom and hopefully help us better na navigate this human predicament in these times. And all of you here, and there's so many people here, we have all people from all of the states, Canada, Japan, the Netherlands, we have people staying up late at the in the UK, um, Costa Rica, all around the world. Um, you're all a sacred community of people that have come together to have this heart mind uh, pointed towards awakening and truth. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jackie Dobrinska. I'm the Education and Outreach Director for Love Serve Remember Foundation. And tonight, it's such an honor uh, to be joined by Raghu Marcus, Mark Watts, and Justin Beretta to talk about these perennial wisdoms by these two great teachers. So before I get to the introductions, um, first, I just want to encourage you all to stick around till the end because we're going to have a really sweet musical meditation with Justin. And we're also going to talk about continuing this journey with Ram Dass and Alan Watts. So make sure you stick around till the end. And then I just want to go over a little bit of housekeeping. So um, there's two different platforms going on. There's this Zoom call. Uh, and for those of the of you who couldn't make the call, we have an overflow YouTube link. Um, and we just wanna welcome everyone, make sure you all know that we're seeing you and that you can ask your questions at any time in the chat of Zoom or in the chat of YouTube. Mangal is on the back end and she's gonna be sharing your questions with me. Um, you're all muted, but whatever platform you're on, we're really hoping that we can create this sense of community. So it's great if you're on Zoom, if you can have your video on so we can see each other. It's great if you want to rename yourself with your location. Lots of people have made whole satsang, local satsangs appear because they found each other on these virtual um, community calls. And then everyone just say hi in the chat, maybe a good word from your day or something you appreciate about being here. So this call should last about 75 minutes. We might go a few minutes long, but we hope to st stick to that. And it's gonna include a couple of short clips by Ram Dass and Alan Watts, as well as some great conversation. And then again, that great musical meditation with Justin at the end. So that brings me to our participants. Um, and I just wanna do some short intros. So Mark Watts, he is the co-founder of the Alan Watts Electronic University that later became alanwatts.org. Um, and he recorded hundreds of Alan's talks starting in 1968, and over the years has curated and produced these talks for public radio and lots of different media projects. Um, in 1973, as a way of disseminating this work, he started offering courses on Connect, on cassette and uh, video seminars. Some of you remember cassettes, right? Um, <laughs> He also produced for the Joseph Campbell Audio Collection and archival projects for the San Francisco Zen Center, Plum Village, and the Krishna Murti Foundation. He's also the host of Being in the Way podcast, which is part of the Be Here Now network. So such a gift to be with him. Uh, Justin Beretta is the founding member of the Glitch Mob, which is an internationally recognized electronic music group that was formed in 2006. And he's been a practitioner of Vipassana meditation for over 10 years and has led this um, spatial and ambient music performances around the world. And he has some really amazing collaborations, including these two tracks with Ram Dass, Imagine and Awareness, and two tracks with Alan Watts, um, Dream and Listen, and you can find those on all of those streaming services. And then of course we have uh, Raghu Marcus. He was the host of Ram Dass is Here and Now for many, many years. Um, he also has his own podcast called Mind Rolling, and he's the executive director of Love Serve Remember Foundation. He started his career in the music industry at a big radio station in Canada and then went on to develop Triloka Records, which um, you all know because you've listened to so many of those great Kirtan artists and world musicians and other multimedia projects. And he was one of the original satsang members who spent time in India with Ram Dass and Neem Karoli Baba in the early 70s. And then it's always weird to introduce yourself, but 
Hi, I'm Jackie, <laughs> <laughs> and I currently host Ram Dass's Here and Now podcast, and I'm the Director of Education and Community for Love, Serve, Remember Foundation. I also teach a lot of yoga and a lot of mystical and earth-based traditions, so I'm just real humbled to be here with you all. And thank you all for taking the time, this precious th resource we have, and being willing and able and excited to spend it here tonight. So without further ado, let's jump in um, on the Dharma of Ramdas and Alan Watts. And just to get us kicked off, we're gonna share a short clip um, with Ramdas talking about his experience with Alan. So JR, wanna share, share that clip real quick? I've told this story before, but it's such a groovy story. Once I took LSD with Alan Watts and his wife. And we had a very groovy time together, and he started to talk, and he talked steadily for eight and a half hours. <laughs> and at first, I got very bugged, and I kept saying things to myself like, doesn't he think anybody else knows anything? What does he think? <laughs> Jano and I would look at each other with great discomfort. Isn't he ever going to shut up? Or... We know he's smart, but does he have to be that smart? And then it dawned on all of us that he was the most exquisite mouthpiece any of us had ever had. And that he was just speaking all of our thoughts. Because every time you'd have another thought, his thing would change. And he was just this silver-tongued mouth that was enunciating all of who we were. And then I was just odd. I never had a mouth like that. I mean, you know. <laughs> That's fine. Isn't that great? So Sounds I'm good. so curious to hear, um, especially from Mark and Raghu, about both Ramdas and Alan Watts, because maybe not everyone here knows both of them. So maybe you could share a little about who they were, how they came together, um, a little bit that way. Well, well Mark, Mark, you take this mic. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take the lead, and then you can, you can fill it. Yeah. But uh, so my father was uh, uh, actually a, a minister. Uh, and trained uh, for the Church of England as a young man, but uh, discovered Buddhism uh, through the Buddhist Lodge in London and took a major detour. Uh, at the age of 14, he declared that uh, he was a Buddhist there at uh, King's School, and uh, his classmates said, Jolly Watt, the man's a Buddhist, and <laughs> took it all with great humor. And uh, so by the time he was 16, he was speaking regularly at the Buddhist Lodge, which is a whole uh, other funny incident, because he originally showed up with his dad when he was about 11 or 12. And um, they had expected, uh, based on the correspondence that they received, that Alan Watts King School was one of the senior masters over at King School. And they were very surprised when the older gentleman sat down and the young man got up to speak. But uh, it went very well. And uh, as Christmas, Christmas Humphreys, who was the barrister, and a leader of the Buddhist Lodge there said that uh, he was talking Zen, uh, pure Zen. And so this is a period in which my father became very interested in the, um, you know, the Zen traditions. And also, you know, because of his uh, introduction to Suzuki, uh, DT Suzuki at the World Congress of Faiths, uh, he became very interested in sort of a combination between uh, Zen methods and, and uh, the, the, the Rinzai school and also, at the same time, he was being exposed to Vedanta. So in, throughout his early career, he brings to us a wonderful combination of the warmth and richness of the Vedanta, thou are that uh, type of tradition, but mixed with this Zen um, you know, a method, uh, shall we call it uh, intellectual yoga, uh, that we see in the Koan method and other places of showing up the mind, using the mind itself. And so that was his early uh, methodology, and he came to the United States and was eventually invited to come and teach at the Academy of Asian Studies in San Francisco. And uh, there he began to meet a whole cast of characters. Uh, one of his early uh, big influences uh, in the direction of Eastern thought when he got to California was Saburo Hasegawa, a Japanese artist who led a, a return to primitivism among Japanese artists and was really a Taoist through and through. And during this time, which was in the mid-50s, um, it's very interesting. I mean, by the mid-50s, my father had actually been speaking publicly for 30 years uh, because he began at age 10 because all of the kids at King's School had to take uh, public speaking and, you know, they were, they were in training uh, to become ministers. 
And so uh, his lectures were very popular and he opened them to the public as a means of raising support for the academy, which was floundering um, economically. And as a result, all of these characters came in the doors, uh, Gary Snyder and uh, a lot of the beat poets of the era. And uh, through this, my father ended up going out, speaking at coffee houses, and eventually ended up on public radio. Uh, due to a series of connections, he became a community programmer. So by the late 50s, we have him there in, in the area, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, giving a talk a series called The Way Beyond the West, which was very popular. Uh, it was uh, known as The Hangover Cure because he recorded Saturday nights. It would be re-aired on Sunday. And um, just the audience was uh, loving all of these interpretations of great books of Asia, um, some of his um, introductions to philosophers that they were familiar with, people like G.K. Chesterton. And um, uh, so this was the mix of things that he went with into the 60s. And somewhere along the way, and I'm not exactly sure, he encountered Ramdas. And um, we have, uh, you know, various uh, humorous accounts of it. We also have a, a couple of uh, in-person meetings. Um, I know that uh, the Be Here Now book came and I was given it to review. And a few weeks later, Ram Das was sitting with my father up on the, uh, I don't know if you can imagine this, but these uh, brightly colored aluminum and uh, fiberglass fabric uh, lawn chairs. Mm -hmm. I think one was bright blue and the other was yellow. And so there they were sitting in these ridiculous chairs underneath the eucalyptus trees, uh, discussing goodness knows what's for hours on end. And um, so that, that's how they got to, together and, and uh, uh, spoke personally. But they were from very different traditions, and yet they were traditions that were headed toward the same place, which is the transcendence of self. And mm -hmm. uh, one through a more uh, a direct confrontative uh, method with the self and one through the uh, dedication to service and uh, the, uh, you know, the, the yoga methods that uh, Ramdas came to prefer. And mm -hmm. Raghu, why don't you fill us in on, on some of that? Well, I, Ramdas never, he'd only say uh, the most broad-based stuff about Alan, you know, like he was extraordinary. He was a, he was amazing. He was complex, you know, those kinds of uh, just pithy statements. I don't know uh, how much I need to go into Ramdas's background. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I think, you know. I would say just a little bit because I'm sure there's some yeah. people here who know Alan better than Ramdas. So, yeah. Well, yeah. be here now. That's it. <laughs> it's Ramdas. <laughs> That and, you know, I mean, basically, uh, Ramdas uh, Ram got tired of coming down from acid and went to India looking for a map of consciousness. And he encountered uh, this incredible being, enlightened being named Neem Karoli Baba, who we call Maharaji. And uh, actually, the first thing that happened is, I mean, aside from being told absolutely everything about his mother's death, which, you know, of course, nobody could know except Ramdas had just come six months earlier. It happened. Aside from that miraculous stuff of, of uh, this being absolutely knowing everything about him, past, present, and future, um, he said, you, you got some of that medicine, that yogi medicine? And Ramdas said, you mean acid? And he said, yeah, give me some. And he just grabbed it. Uh, 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 I think he had a, a handful, but a few of them and just popped it. And only recently, actually, this is kind of funny. I went to the MAPS convention in Denver. And there was somebody at this convention who was an acid maker who had gotten out of jail and was just speaking to the history of Leary and the, the, the brotherhood that we're making this incredible acid and he said yeah white lightning yeah it was about uh it was insane 600 microgram micrograms per dose and which is nobody's heard of that kind of thing and he so he had a few of those and that's when he said it's 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 good to the first time to get to uh you get to go in the room and have darshan meaning be in the presence of christ for a couple hours but then you got to leave it's good for beginners, is basically what he said. 
and uh, and it, he he did it again because Ramdas went home not sure if he actually took it, meaning you know maybe he threw it over his shoulder and I wasn't looking. And so when he came back the second time with us, those of us that went back with him uh, in uh, 1970 towards the end of the year, and he he said to Ramdas, "You got more of that." yogi medicine and ramdas said yeah and then he, he did i take it last time he said <laughs> and then he picked another few and physically you know put his tongue out and put it on his tongue and went through you know this whole rigmarole playing the game of of making sure ramdas understood what this substance was what it could do and what it had done for people, but it fell short of the reality of an enlightened um, for ever moment, right? It was a moment, but it wasn't a forever moment. And uh, so Ramdas, that's what united him with many, many people who were interested in psychedelic investigation and one of them was alan watts and that's where that wonderful piece comes from which is really cool so obviously ramdas came back and he be here now came out and he's written he wrote a lot of other books and spent his latter years after the stroke uh, in maui a good portion of it and uh, that's when love serve remember foundation was formed to represent the, his teachings coming from him but essentially from Neem Karoli Baba, whose only teaching was love everyone, serve everyone, and remember God. And uh, so this, the, uh, there's a gigantic dichotomy, supposedly, between what Alan represents, Alan Watts represents, and what Ramdas represents. And as Mark just said, they may have started on different sides of the mountain, but they got to the summit and realized there is only one thing going on, which is the uh, Maharaj used to say, he, he'd just point his finger like this and go, Sabek, it's all one. There is only one thing. There's the same Krishna, Ram, Muhammad, Buddha, Christ, one. There, there's only a one. And that uh, really was a, a huge um, turn of events for us in terms of thinking we were going to a Hindu guru or anything like that, because it was not that. Even though, like Alan, he picked up stuff from Vedanta that worked for him. We picked up stuff in Bhakti Yoga that worked for him, but also with uh, Buddhism. And so this combination of the two of them is absolutely unique and um, really marvelous. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that combining of, of philosophies, they both did so well. Um, my father in the later uh, parts of his life with Taoism and Vajrayana, Adriana, and um, I think that they were both bright enough and sensitive enough to recognize the similarities and how they um, played together intellectually. And I think that, uh, you know, Taoism came into my father's life uh, three times, uh, once when he was young, uh, once when he was working on the way of Zen uh, in uh, the mid 50s. And then later in life, when he met Al Wong and, um, you know, started down, down that path. And I think that that was a place that opened him up to a lot of different types of uh, spiritual teachings. I think the Zen people tend to be a little bit, uh, you know, angled toward purism. Uh, they, they have a, a lot of rules and want to know how long you've meditated and all of that. And uh, to this, my father replied famously, a cat sits until it's done sitting gets up, stretches, and walks away. And so he was never really in that camp altogether. And this is where the uh, beautiful parts of uh, uh, Vedanta and Thou Art That and, uh, and the power uh, of the spirit that that brings uh, to what is otherwise a very, um, uh, in, in ways, a very technical path, uh, the koan method and all of that. Mm. And I think that uh, as these acid experiences started to, to come into the culture. I mean, my dad took his first dose in 1958, I think. Really? And, yeah, yeah, Dittman in, in LA, the group of psychologists who were doing experiments in Los Angeles. And um, you know, did it here and there on and off uh, again and again. 
And the interesting thing he had to say was a very similar uh, conclusion, which is that um, uh, it, it's a good tool, but a poor master. It's a good way to mm. get the message. But as he was fond of saying, once you get the message, hang up the phone, because there is <laughs> yeah. a very solid message there. And, uh, and so this is the, really the joyous place that these guys came together by the mid-60s. Uh, there was, it was such a, a celebration of energy. There was the Houseboat Summit. Summer of 67 was outrageous. Uh, there was so much uh, of that energy in the air. And uh, by 1969, it had really coalesced into a very articulate movement. Um, you know, we were seeing great publications and journals, and you know, there are movements afoot to uh, legalize the use of uh, psychedelics. And uh, then it, um, uh, you know, went, went, that went pretty well into the early 70s. And then gradually law enforcement began to uh, clamp down on mm. it. And I uh, mean, a series of times, and uh, it was really bled out of the culture for quite a period. Yeah. And uh, it was only in recent years has come back in any meaningful yeah. way. Thanks to uh, Rick Doblin and MAPS, yeah. things are really changing <laughs> yeah. on that yeah. score. Yeah. But you know, I, 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 go ahead, Raghav. I was just going to say that Alan Watts and Ramdas the tremendous influence of bringing the mystic east to the west i mean there were other teachers who did it you know plenty of them but not with that uh huge audience uh, that that's that's kept moving and expanding over all these years to to today i mean it's proof i mean both of them are on the be here now network podcast network and it's astounding how many people are tuning in. These, it's not Joe Rogan, you know, it's uh, consciousness. <laughs> so that's, uh, and I think there's one word that describes why that is, and it's trust. Mm -hmm. People have an innate trust when they hear each of, of these beings, both of them, that yeah. leads them to open up in a way that... Um, just transcends the fact that they aren't in bodies now. I mean, Ramdas, of course, was in a, a body, you know, for decades after Alan. But in this moment, it still gets my attention. Just the level of that trust, because uh, you know, as a director of the Love Serve Remember Foundation, I see the incoming um, response, and it's extraordinary. And and I can only describe it as that trust, which leads to what both of them prescribed intuition connect with your intuition and uh and and be able to then uh, get into a f a real flow where you can not just nourish yourself but those around you and, and that trust comes from trusting yourself yeah uh, and a little yeah. clip thing that i circulated about when he talks about me, mm. about the patterns of nature that maybe you can't exactly identify but you sure know them when you see them and feel them and they never make an aesthetic mistake. And he goes on to say that your mind is the manifestation of Lee. And that uh, if you just uh, trust it, uh, it will do the right things. It will make the right decisions. Um, and the reality is that uh, what we do in the, these practices is quiet down the interferences, interference patterns that prevent us from trusting. Mm. And yeah. uh, so it begins internally. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to take a moment and loop Justin in. You were talking about these new audiences coming in and these flow states, and just, uh, Justin's worked with in mm -hmm. these collaborations. And I'm curious, Justin, if you would sort of speak into what drew you to both of them um, and their teachings. Oops, are you there? Check one, two. How's that? Yeah. Yep. Yes. There we go. Um, so for me, I had. My father had Alan Watts books around growing up, and I remember picking them up as a as a teenager and trying. I remember it was uh, on the book on the taboo against knowing who you are, and I couldn't really make heads or tails of it, but it's it was in there somewhere. And it wasn't actually until um, later on in life, and I started going down the meditation path and had my own psychedelic experiences that I actually came back in contact with these these words and in with um with vipassana style meditation and it just felt like something you said ragu really resonated with me was that there is a map in here and that ultimately the map 
was, it was, I was meant to put down the books and just crack on with living life and not, not spend all my life on a cushion. And for me, um, the best way to transmit this love and this, um, this care that I found for these teachings was just to, to put it in music and music is it's my form of communication. And I thought, um, what better way than to, I, I think of music and these talks, it's almost like when you have to give a dog a pill and you put it in peanut butter. I mean, sometimes yeah, it, yeah. Just, it <laughs> makes it go down and, and there's a way for, for people to let me, if you, if the uh, the text becomes too much, the music can sort of take over and it's a way of comforting. So this, you know, it's different than music that's instrumental. Yeah. The music is really just meant there to be a container for these and for other teachings to, um, to transmit around the world. And especially in this day and age, um, music travels so quickly and so immediately. And I've connected to so many incredible people through this. And there's lots of other folks that have, have, have been making um, audio like this. And for me, the, both Alan Watts and Ram Dass were my, um, my ramp into this whole practice. Mm. I also think there's this great thing about like the music, like changes the brain state. And then you get these, these talks that come in, um, that sort of can hit in a different way. Yeah. And it, it's just really amazing. Mm. And they definitely yeah. mutually enhance each other. The, uh, the, uh, music heightens the, uh, presentation of the talk and the talk is obviously uh, brings greater uh, feeling to the music. So it's a, it's a beautiful combination. And uh, I just, I love the things that Justin's done. Yeah. So there's so many great things that have you've already been started to talk about, and there's so many things we can talk about, and we only have this short amount of time. So we wanted to focus a little bit. And so we have another clip that we want to play. Uh, it's sort of Ramdas and Alan Watts talking about, um, something from their very, their different perspectives. And again, it sort of meets in the middle. So Jared, do you want to play that, that clip for us real quick? A person who thinks all the time has nothing to think about except thoughts. So he loses touch with reality and lives in a world of illusions. By thoughts, I mean specifically chatter in the skull, perpetual and compulsive repetition of words, of reckoning and calculating. I'm not saying that thinking is bad. Like everything else, it's useful in moderation. And all so-called civilized peoples have increasingly become crazy and self-destructive because through excessive thinking they have lost touch with reality. That's to say, we confuse signs, words, numbers, symbols, and ideas with the real world. Most of us would have rather money than tangible wealth, and a great occasion is somehow spoiled for us unless photographed. And to read about it the next day in the newspaper is oddly more fun for us than the original event. This is a disaster. For as a result of confusing the real world of nature with mere signs, such as bank balances and contracts, we are so tied up in our minds that we've lost our senses. Time to wake up. And the stuff of the lecture is all, of course, just the finger pointing at the moon. It's not the moon, because the way in which we share a common space, which I am talking to, that cannot be described because it is not, words do not go there. The way is beyond words. It is only known in the silence. And to know that part of yourself is to know 
that part of you that is behind words and behind thought. And how you and I touch the place in ourselves that is behind thought, behind word. involves, first of all, understanding that that's desirable, and then exploring methods to do that. Thank you. So, you know, when I hear that, those two clips together, just that idea of how the mind catches us in all of these ways and that there's this something behind the mind, um, but I'm so curious if you both, if you all could sort of speak into that, that particular topic, those topics. Well, the very beginning that was cut off is a person who thinks all the time has nothing to think about except thoughts, and therefore they lose touch with reality. And, um, you know, I, there's a, just a wonderful aspect to this, which is a, a full appreciation of what we normally call materiality or in the material world. Um, I remember uh, a discussion once in which somebody was, uh, was actually a, a German graduate student, was arguing that abstract ideas were much more spiritual than, um, th than uh, talk of, of the physical world. And my father said to him, so you say that one plus two equals three is a more spiritual proposition <laughs> than tomato. And he said, oh, of course. He says, I'm sorry, I'm going to go with the tomato. <laughs> And um, so I, the, the, other, the thing that he would say um, is that thought is a good tool, but a poor master. Mm. And I think that this really starts to get to the heart of the problem, which is that um, as a culture, we like magic bullets. We like things that are very effective, um, magical means. And so <clears throat> in, in the ego and in, in the, the reflective process, um, there are tools that appear to be very powerful but are actually of very limited use. I mean, they're, they're, they're very effective in a very limited realm. And I think that that's what uh, begins to come out when a person uh, thinks all the time and, and specializes in thought. And I think the same thing that he said uh, of thinking at that time, thinking is a good tool, but a poor master, also today applies to technology because we've made uh, the, the use of technology such a reinforcement of thinking and of content and of, of verbal dialogue. And like, like thought, um, it can actually act as an interference pattern and obscure. So technology, these are good tools, but again, we're masters. Mm, it's a good example, technology and, and the mind thinking, the level at which we are hooked on this technology. Just look at us all with our phones right by us 99% of the time. You know, that just reflects exactly that. So uh, I think, Mark, I told you this, but uh, uh, I'll mention it again for everybody. So in, in the uh, process of getting a course together with Ram Dass and Alan, I was listening to a lot more Alan Watts than I have listened to since 1968, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and pleasantly surprised because, uh, you know, as soon as I heard Ram Dass, I became a little bit one-dimensional. And it took after a few years before I started, you know, going back, listening to little Alan, listening to some of the Tibetan stuff, etc. So I'm, I, I come upon this thing. Of course, he was talking, and you'll know this, uh, Mark, how society says that, You've got to play the game, right? We have to play the game. And that game of life is very serious. And it made me think, of course, uh, Ram Dass always talked about, you've got to really deal with self-seriousness. You've got to have a sense of humor or you, there's no possibility of getting through the day-to-day. -day. And you've got to get involved with the game, but forget it's a game. And then he said... And th this, this struck me so powerfully. I don't think I did tell you this, Mark. Bodhi, the Bodhisattva doesn't give his show away. 
he is he or she is released from the game yet they're playing the game and it reminded me of neem karoli baba he was having the he looked like he was having the most fun of anybody i'd ever met you know playing with playing around with a bunch of us crazy hippies that had come from the west and so on and so forth and yet you absolutely knew there was nothing behind it that was attached to any action in any way so your father alan just said this so perfectly doesn't give his show away he's released from the game and that's how he came in so there there's just uh, you know your dad has some fantastic way of putting things in a perspective through some magical poetic words it's really quite something um yeah should yeah, i go but, further jackie i've got i don't know what our timing is but you tell uh, me we've we've got uh, definitely some more minutes to sort of discuss this clip before we open it up for questions so yeah go for it i'm just also thinking um, so we were putting stuff together around love right and i said to mark gee i don't know <laughs> What did, did Alan talk much about love? And he said, oh yeah, no, no problem. <laughs> and, I, and, and so there's just this, this great stuff, um, particularly there's uh, around sexual love. And he talked about we're blind and we think that, uh, you know, we're blind to the fact that, that sexual love is a many varied thing, not only between a couple of people or whatever, but it is the erotic relationship to the world. Ramdas talks about, um, let's see if I have something about, the, um, in devotional tantra, you relate to the mother. The mother covers the world such that everything you experience, that breeze you hear now, is the caress of the mother, the pain in your knee, the prodding, the chiding of the mother, all of which is designed at one level to seduce you into clinging and attachment. That is maya, the illusion. This is the dance of life, and yet at the same moment, for someone who wants to awaken, real, realizing it is all just the mother, helps you to relate to and love, to, love her and incorporate her into every moment in your life which is exactly, in my mind, what Alan was talking about uh, with the erotic nature of, of becoming absorbed into everything, right? I mean, just w different ways. It was mind-blowing. Yeah. My, my father and I once had a very humorous conversation about whether gravity and love might actually be the same thing. They're pulling up Webster's saying, you know, the attraction of one celestial body to another. Well, that's interesting. Hmm. Uh, but um, the, one of the... the uh, talks he actually talks about relationships and is is in this it's a divine madness and uh mm. it's, it's it's a wonderful uh, side that he did it's just sort of a left turn in the middle of the seminar and gave a whole session about this um, i don't know what was going on in the audience that inspired it but uh there he went and uh one of the, the he, he starts out by saying I, I want to talk to you about a particularly virulent form of divine madness called falling in love <laughs> whereupon somebody who in the eyes of anybody else is a perfectly normal human being, male, female, suddenly becomes a god or goddess incarnate. And he goes on to talk about what this can lead to and the insanity and, you know, all of the, the things that come to you. Then he comes back around and he says, but I'd like to propose to you that perhaps it is when we are in the state that we, for the first time, see each other for who we truly are. And I, I think that that's uh, a very profound filter that um, this, the way that we look at love in Western culture um, has messed with. Uh, because I, I think that there, there are a lot of uh, politics of love and there are a lot of um, social definitions of, of things around love that actually have nothing to do with the experience of love. And um, so I, I think that, that some of these talks are very liberating. The, the one, um, uh, the other one, the spectrum of love, is he talks about all of the varieties of love, of, of you know, uh, this kind of love, that kind of love, and also the, the degrees of, uh, of uh, human sexuality. And you start to see that this is something that is far beyond uh, the definitions and the, uh, the 
the language uh, that we have for it. And I think that, um, you know, in this, he then starts to take it back to, um, you know, some of these really uh, profound Vedanta ideas about, you know, thou are that, and uh, the one that we loved as kids, uh, which is the game of hide and seek. And this is the not giving up the game on the ultimate level, uh, where we, uh, uh, the, the great god or, or, or goddess uh, dreams that it's everything in creation. Uh, but during the days of, of Brahman, he, know, he, she, it knows what it is. But during the nights, it's just asleep and dreaming on all of us. And the game is not to know that and not to give the show away. And uh, this, is, this is such a beautiful metaphor uh, for the places that we find ourselves in living in a society. And uh, it was really interesting because my sister, who's a computer scientist specialist, uh, not um, in this field particularly at all, although now later in life, she's becoming mildly interested. Um, but uh, I had seen, uh, we hadn't really been together much as a family. And some 35 years after my father had told us the game of hide and seek, we were sitting around talking and she was listening to my sisters. And then one of them was saying that they went to the unity church. And the other one said that they prefer, preferred the Presbyterian church. They were living in Pennsylvania at the time. And she turned to me and she said, you know, I could never go in for that Jesus stuff. That, that story that dad used to tell us about the game and hide, hide and seek, that just made so much sense to me. It was just, I mean, of course. And I was just, I smiled. I thought Joseph Campbell would be so happy right now <laughs> that this is a myth, a story has mm. sustained this woman's life for 30 years with no spiritual questions whatsoever mm. after, you know, just hearing this short uh, little story. Mm. Uh, that's so great. That's really beautiful. Yeah, that's really great. Well, talking yeah, about, oh, go ahead, Jack. I was just going to say one of the things I love in that particular talk is this idea of there's no good or bad love. You just have to find mm. what it is that you love and let that sort of grow because of just how we yeah. confused we get around it. Um, mm. What were you going to say, Raghu? No, just that just pretty much in the same direction that you spoke to with Alan talking about with love, we open ourselves so we can become conduit pipes for the flow, right? And Ramdas said, we work on ourselves so that we radiate love to whoever we're around. So really on the same page, coming at it again from completely different points of view. And the other interesting thing, uh, yes, the, the stuff around relationships. Um, talk, talk, and you'd, you'd think Ramdas, who constant, who married people, like he would marry a bunch of people in Maui and before that, and it was always about the triangle, and there was the third uh, connecting point in the triangle was the divine. So everything that happens in a relationship is is put through that lens, and that's the way uh, that one can really use it as a yoga, right? Then he said, well, about uh, the yoga of relationship. And I want to tell you that as a yoga, it's a stinker. In fact, if you have a choice, use any other yoga but the yoga of relationship because it's one of the hardest yogas to use because it's working with reproduction and survival and a whole lot of things that make it almost impossible to stay awake in it. Pride, righteousness, all that stuff, freedom of space and time. Oy. <laughs> uh, so good. So many good thing quotes. Hmm. So um, if you all are open to it, I'd, I'd love to open our discussion to some questions from our audience. So um, everyone who's watching or here know that you can, if you have a question, put it in the chat and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Clearly, we're probably not gonna get to all of them. Can I ask um, the first question? Though? Please go for it. This question is from a good friend of mine. Many of you probably know who he is, or you should if you don't. Duncan Trussell wanted me to ask you, Mark, Duncan Trussell is a huge Dune fan, Frank Herbert. And he said he read that uh, Frank lived not far when, when Alan had the houseboat in Sa Sausalito. They were not that far from each other. And when he reads Dune, he just sees all of this material emanating, it seems like, from Alan. Is there any truth to that? Certainly, yeah, because they would uh, run into each other. It was called the Big G Market. 
uh, oh. over where they both went uh, grocery shopping and they uh, both would walk back and forth. And so I think they had their chats scrolling down gate five Avenue mm. and, uh, and then they would just go back to their, their lives. But yeah, they're, they're definitely, uh, there's, there's some connection. Yeah. That's so great. I ain't thinking about Dune. Amazing. I never sat, I was never in on any of the conversations, so I can't tell you more. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, the, and this is that. sort of a similar question in that line of like, is this true? Um, Trevor asked if if it is true if Ramdas was going to meet Alan in Japan before finding Bhagavan Das and Neem Karoli Baba. Do you know if that's the, either of you know if that's no. the case? No. Mm-hmm. Okay. No. No. no Be, I mean, he was he was going to go with this friend, uh, David Padua, actually, uh, who gave him the the uh, vehicle, the uh, the bus or whatever it was, uh, SUV of some sort, uh, and he didn't go. He was going to meet him there. That's all we ever heard. Not Alan. My father was in Japan in '63 and '65, but it's interesting that you mentioned David Padua because that's where we used to stay every time we went to New York. Oh, really? House on 77th between Park and Madison. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so there's just an absolutely coolest house. It was 12 feet wide, 60 feet deep, and there's so there are two rooms on each level. And he did wow. uh, every room in a completely different world theme. Very interesting guy. Yeah, very much. That would have been, fun. That would have been fun. interesting that they had that in common. Mm. So, uh, Sarah Q asks, uh, What are Alan and Ramdas's views on separateness? Alan said once that we depend on knowing who someone else is in order to know who we are. How does that fit with sub ek? Hmm. Well, well, okay. From Ram Dass's uh, side, he was a an excellent psychologist, and that's why his his bringing some of the uh, you know, interpreting the Eastern themes from, and he went into all traditions, Buddhist and Vedanta and, and Bhakti and all of it. Um, it was, and and this was a, a major uh, part of his teachings through throughout his life, which was uh, exemplified actually in this movie, Becoming Nobody. If you haven't seen that, that really speaks to what we're talking about because what's becoming nobody? And it's not a matter of uh, completely rejecting that uh, ego, that I that tells the story and that has the trauma that has the habitual patterns and neurotic tendencies it's a matter of investigating going within to investigate the source of the grasping and clinging that we do uh, in regards to our thoughts to our emotions and so on so that's how ramdas attacked that uh, and uh, using, uh, you know, I mean, Justin has been, uh, was introduced to a Vipassana meditation. So we were we back then, and it was a major fulcrum for us to be able to investigate that separateness. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, Buddha, the world's first great uh, psychotherapist. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot there's a lot to be found found there clinging and yeah. uh, the, the all these ideas of the self i mean this is where you know according to the buddhist traditions this is the seed of suffering yeah um, uh, any tradition i think yeah <laughs> pretty much this next question is sort of parallel to that um did alan believe that we are all one or that we are nothing and they write i get confused around Bo- buddhism <laughs> How is nothing everything? <laughs> That's <from> Alex. <laughs> it, it, because it's the clear space in the middle, the diamond space. And, and it, you know, the example that he used is the eye does not see itself. And so nothing isn't the type of nothing that we think of it in the West. Nothing is the fullness of consciousness, uh, but it is also empty. And that allows things to come into it. As the Taoist expression says, 30 spokes has the wheel, but it's the hub that makes it useful. So mm-hmm. there's that, that negative space. Mm-hmm. And um, so and it's really interesting in um, I studied Native American uh, rock writing, uh, which is the, we call it rock art, but it's actually rock writing. 
and their uh, symbol for a good or open path is two parallel lines, but there's nothing in the center. See, it's that, that openness in the way. And you see this in the symbolism of the Ching. Uh, you see this in the, in the Enzo. Uh, it's all celebration about that uh, emptiness that has, has such potential. So are we one? Yes. And what are we connected by? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I would just add that when we're talking emptiness, is a tough word for us in the West because it nihilistic uh, um, repercussions because that's the way we are brought up. But it's emptiness of the self-centered I is probably the most simplistic way to put that. Yeah, when you're right. empty of the self-centered I, then we are all one because yeah. we we'll realize the interconnectivity of everyone and everything. Yeah, when you but say you only that, have I hear... to be around a, a Zen master to know that uh, uh, to be empty is not to be not not present. <laughs> yeah, it's, right. it's the most powerfully present. Yeah, makes me think of the the wave and the ocean, and not identifying with the wave so much. It also makes me think of music, right? The space in, when you were talking, Mark, that this what happens with music is the space that's in between. Um, yeah. I wonder if Justin can if it has anything to say on emptiness as well. Yeah, it really is the um, think of of the negative space between the notes. Or when I was creating these pieces, um, especially with um, "Listen," the the Alan Watts one, there's so much space in between the, the phrases that I would go in and score, 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 and actually sort of go into a creative state and play a bunch of music, but then the real magic came when I went back and I was removing and removing and removing things. And if you notice, there's lots of space in those tracks because I thought how ironic would it be if I would have created all this empty space and then filled it up with a bunch of noise, <laughs> which mm -hmm. wouldn't be something that you may have typically would like to listen to in an album or rock album. It's just a bunch of empty, empty space, but I would have uh, experimented with techniques on how to fill up sonic space. So it's not completely silent because that speaks volumes. It's the it's this ineffable thing that I think music actually is the best at communicating. If words can be quite clunky, but music can communicate a sense of spaciousness and emptiness in a in a profound and universal way. Yeah, and, and without well emptiness, we, you don't you don't even you can't have melody. I mean, it's 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 so fun, such a fundamental. Um, component of even the most uh, uh, common forms of music. It's very interesting. Uh, my father was a master of the pause and, you know, the cadence of his talks was just so um, rich. And uh, it was interesting because sometimes he would, when he, we were in a seminar, he would really play that out. And, um, you know, and he was channeling the energy of the room and he was connecting with everybody in the room. And it was very, when he was, when you were there and he was doing it live, it was very present. But when I began to produce him for public radio, at first in the 70s, but particularly in the mid 90s, I realized that a pause that works in a room where he is present does not work the same way when he's not present, but you're listening to the recording. And by rule of thumb, I started shortening them around 10%. And it was very interesting because I would then go back and listen to, and I was every time I could tell exactly whether I'd not shortened it quite enough or shortened it a little bit too much. There was an absolute dynamic to that pause. And um, so there's, you know, there's a, a breathing uh, that's going on with the communication that isn't uh, immediately apparent, but is, is very strong. Mm. That's cool. Yeah. So we have another question. We have so many questions. We're not going to be able to get to them all, but we'll try to get to a few more. Um, this is from Angelica, and she's sort of talking about Dharma, um, wondering if either or both um, speak into using one's gifts or natural talents um, and how to move past stuckness in that arena. In fulfilling one's dharma in life? Mm -hmm. is what we're like purpose. About. I'm guessing like a sense of purpose and being able to contribute and um, use your natural gifts in that way. And um, I know there's some information in there and I'd love to hear from either of you about it. Well, take start with uh, Alan's uh, premise, that, not premise, but words that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, realize you're, you're in the game, you're expected to play it a certain way, 
and uh, extricating yourself, these are my words, from that game means uh, stop taking ourselves so seriously. So it's, it really is a matter of disengaging uh, with the clinging. So then, then that at that point, one can really start to uh, vibe, shall we say, with what it is that one should be doing in this life, either career or in family or in relationships uh, of all sorts. And uh, until, uh, until, the, uh, until we really lose some of these uh, gigantic habitual patterns that are formed through clinging and attachment, uh, it's very difficult to know what your quote-unquote best next move is. I mean, because it's going to be fraught with repulsion or attraction. You know, uh, Alan, uh, in this thing that we developed, I mean, there's a lot of talk around the Tao and the way of things and being in flow. And there's uh, some great, great stuff from both of them, both of them on that very subject. Ramdas was a big devotee of the Third Zen Patriarch. Um, and and it starts out with if you have no pre you know no preferences is the way you know not exactly that but that's pretty much what it says the way is easy for those with no preference the, those who have no preferences so um, you, that's why working on oneself and going inside to really find out who we are where you know mindfulness is phenomenal practice it really is and, and it totally goes along with uh, particularly with uh, vipassana meditation and uh, it, it uh, you can't just assume that you're going to think it and it, you'll be it <laughs> you ha you know we have to do the work on a day-to-day -day basis to extricate ourselves without and then taking alan's lead without being the big doer that you're going to do anything, but you got to make a move. It's an interesting little tight wire act about yeah. doing something that can help es extricate yourself and at the same time become just as attached to that thing you're doing and you get caught all over. So, um, you know, uh, we've been involved with Bhakti Yoga in, through Ram Dass's lead um when we went over to india and then realized uh when ramdas said to maharaji well how do i get enlightened and he wanted some specific meditation so that you know he could break through in an instant like mark like you said you know we all want that magic bullet right especially in the west and maharaji said oh yeah uh love everyone and ramdas thought to himself that's cheap I have friends who are getting these phenomenal Tibetan teachings, Buddhist teachings, you know, that are in sitting caves for years. And you're telling me to love everyone? So he put it another way. How do I raise Kundalini? And he said, feed everybody. And that just destroyed Ram Dass's <laughs> whole deal around what am I going to do to get myself advanced in the spiritual course of life, you know? And, and Alan also, you know, really... Uh, he he breaks that crystal that has formed in all of our minds. He helps do that with his words. Yeah, Mark, do you want to speak into that a little bit? Well, I mean, think just generally, as uh, you know, the going back to the magic bullet thing. As a culture, we are doing, doing, doing. And uh, there's a really interesting talk that my father gave when he was wandering up on the mountainside. It's called "Conversation with Myself," and uh, he talks about the symbiosis of, of nature and how uh, uh, butterflies and uh, how bees and flowers are actually the same organism. We did a, uh, an animation about it. But then he sits down and he makes tea and he starts, you know, getting focused. And he talks about a, a planetary alarm conference that he had just been to on saving the planet. This is in 1971 in Los Angeles. And he said, um, you know, we're busy, busy doing all the time. And the problem, the challenge for us as a culture is how do we stop doing? How do we return the control of nature back to nature? 
uh, natural homeostasis. And this is really what it amounts to if we're going to save ourselves and the planet. And, and he said, and the thing is, that there's nothing that we can do by anything that we would call doing uh, to, to affect that. And uh, I think it's just a beautiful moment. Then he stops and he takes his big drink of tea and you know, Japanese ceremonial tea, good on a cold day. <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, I, we're, we're overachievers and, um, uh, you know, busy, 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 but what's it all about? There's something about uh, some of these lectures that I've been listening to recently from Alan um, that really struck me also about these ideas of like pleasure and spontaneity um, right. and, and listening to that in some way as well. So I don't know if that plays into that question in your minds, but it did in mine for sure. Certainly spontaneity. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. We are so rigid. That's a, that's a, a wonderful way to relax a little bit. It's it's part and parcel to uh, not taking oneself too seriously. It, all of that is really important. Yeah. And it also speaks to skill and, and competence. You know, uh, one of the things that uh, my father points out is that we really can't enjoy anything uh, in the material world uh, without skill. And he talks about cooking, sailing, mm-hmm. lovemaking. You know, all of this requires you to be present and uh to you know to to learn and to participate and uh, it's not something that uh you know just the force of doing is going to effective yeah i love like the art of pleasure and like how the things that we love become can be like we're not good at that necessarily of just the art of pleasure and i really that spoke to me deeply he, he he likes to say uh uh, Americans are reputed to be materialists, but nothing could be further from the truth. The entire enterprise is dedicated in turning material into garbage as rapidly as possible. <laughs> so, you know, you would think that, you know, the richest culture on earth, that we would arrive home to a great banquet and, you know, wonderful music and dancing and orgies and, you know, just the richest possible uh, experience each evening. But what do we do instead? Uh, we sit down to a can tube uh, version of reality flickering in our in our living rooms and have some to go or you know frozen food and uh, it's all uh, uh, absent you know all of the the great appreciation and um, we used to in the ferry boat there was uh, uh, where we lived and and gave seminars it was a great big hulk of a thing and then right behind it they had built these yacht harbors. And they're awful plastic sailboats. I always used to think, oh my goodness, if this thing comes loose, it's going to tear right through there. So we always kept a good eye on the lines. But we noticed that almost none of those boats ever went out. Because although these people had uh, the money to acquire a sailboat, they didn't have the time to actually learn the art of sailing. Mm. And so most of them would sit there month after month. And you know, maybe they would find a friend a couple of times a year who knew how to sail to take them out. But um, it's, it's not easy. Yeah, for sure. It's, it feels almost like a tantric idea, like the embodiment um, of finding your way through God, to God through the embodiment of being here. Yeah. Um, so, wow. It's Eastern Standard Time. It's already a little after nine. Um, and we still have this incredible musical meditation and to hear from Justin about how this came about. So I think we need to wrap up the Q&A part, which you know, isn't enough time, but you are all lucky. So before we jump into the meditation, I just, I think Raghu and I want to talk a little bit, maybe Mark, you want to jump in too, about this collaboration, this like really unique collaboration that we've been working on, um, where people can continue to dive into these top, these topics we've brought up, separation, uh, awakening from the illusion, love, money, work, and play, um, being in harmony in the Tao, these are all things that we've been working on to bring together in this incredible course um, that's avail- going to start October 2nd um, that includes just wisdom from both of these teachers as well as um, live talks with four or actually five different wisdom keepers of our time who will be sort of pulling apart some of these um, topics a little bit more deeply, including weekly 
community calls where we all of you there's so many questions there it's, a lot of those questions can get answered in the monday dharma talks or the thursday community calls and practicums one person called the practicum she's like it's like going to a lab you know when you're in college and you went mm -hmm. or high school and you went to the uh, lecture and then you went to the lab and the practicums like the lab um, and then we have this online community um, and it's just, it's, it starts October 2nd and it's really amazing. And so if you, this was interesting and you like want to, this feels like just this tiny little taste test, right? Like we just had an hors d'oeuvre and maybe you want the full meal. Really encourage you to check out this course. Do you have anything you want to say about it, Raghu or Mark? Well, just the amazing thing that I said, er, you know, about it and that I said earlier was how these two men come from such different perspectives and the way that the course was curated shows because of the you know the particular themes that we are uh presenting which jackie just mentioned and uh the way that they point to uh, dissecting these themes comes from such an incredibly different place i mean it's amazing yet it just fits together, you know, uh, just wo it weaves itself together on its own. That's what I found when this uh, course was developed and we were involved with the day to day of it and going into it. And, you know, Mark, you were concerned in the very beginning. How is this going to play between, oh. you know, Ramdas and Alan? And, and I said, well, Beautiful. we're going to see. Well, I, I think it's the, the differences that make it such a rich intersection. Uh, there's so much to talk about. It's such fertile ground. Um, there are there are many avenues that you can go on, but there are also some very key central themes. And I think uh, Noah, in, in putting the audio together, uh, did an incredible job. When I went back, I started listening to what he'd done. Mm. Uh, this is really good. And I told him, this is, is amazing. And now the fun is going to be to see how that then you know, manifests with all of the teachers and uh, with all of the people that come to the course and interact. And uh, it's gonna be wonderful discussions. I uh, did a seminar once with uh, Nora Bateson at Eslin, and we did something similar where we played Gregory Bateson and my father back and forth. Mm. And so immediately between Nora and I and these recordings, we had a four-way conversation and there were 12 people in the workshop and very quickly we had a most amazing 16-way conversation going. And so I think each of these uh, sessions has the opportunity to be like that. And as Nora and I, when we looked at each other after after five days, we said, five days? That was five days? Are you kidding? It felt like five hours. Um, <laughs> you know, this is uh, this is very rich stuff. And, and uh, I think that uh, there's a lot for, for everybody to unpack and, uh, and discover in all of this. Yeah. And unique. This has never been presented before no. where these perspectives are joined together by the by ramdas and alan watts uh, everybody knows them uh, as an individual and then as as ramdas talked about it in the beginning how much fun basically he had with alan and uh but never have we presented uh in a way that's curated as you said noah did a phenomenal job in a Can't way that really a lot of hours yeah that went into yeah. it yeah, and that just speaks to being able to help us all go inside with these two different perspectives that really trigger different kinds of responses is, is amazing. I'm, I'm really happy real, we did this. And the real fun is what it's going to become in the, in the, in the following weeks. Yeah, has uh, it been awesome. Yeah. It's, 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 that's that's the, the creative part. Yeah. yeah. And It'll there's Jackie, there's bonuses, right? That yeah, you, you get, get some scrapbook, uh, digital scrapbooks and some wallpaper and um this incredible community. It's it is gonna be fun. It's it's exciting. And the community parts are really um enriching. And people make I've in these um, past ones, like I've met people later, they're like, I met lifelong friends that like, they're going to be lifelong friends through courses yeah. or gatherings. So, so really, um, you know, you'll get an email, but if you want to check it out right away, it's ramdas.org slash Dharma. Um, and you D H A R M A yeah. Dharma. It's going to be amazing and lots of fun and so great mm -hmm. to join live. So, 
So with that, I'm just going to say thank you to both for everyone for being here. And then I'm going to turn it over to Justin. The coup d'etat. Yes, to talk about these All collaborations right. and then share this incredible um, music meditation with us. I'm not sure if that's what you're calling it. That's what I called it. I like that, musical meditation. Yeah, we haven't really come up with the, with the term for it. But yeah, this was one of the last ones that we released. I am working on some new ones right now um but this is was on a compilation called inner space music that came out uh, mid last year that had lots of uh, ram das and alan watts and, and re-envisioned by various artists and there's also jack cornfield tarbrock on there and muji a lot of really incredible musicians and as i was going through and listening i thought this one um it's just it's just such a perfect way to cap off something like this. So I'm just going to go ahead and play this video, which is called Just Be, and it can be found um, anywhere, Spotify, YouTube, all of the things. So let's go ahead and hit play here. Do people need to like go lie down, get comfortable, or are we just good listening? <laughs> you can you can lie down, you could light a candle, you could dance around, whatever, whatever feels good. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you, Justin. What I would like to invite you to do is to um, sit as straight as you can and we're going to meditate for about 10 minutes. For some of you that'll be the, a new experience. And for some of you even the term meditation is an alien term. It's part of the, the balancing we're trying to do between getting out in the marketplace and cultivating the inner quiet space. So first just get here. Just breathe gently and sit with what you're experiencing at this moment. You're experiencing tiredness. Let yourself be tired if you're feeling hot or cold, if you're feeling the seat under you, sounds outside, don't push anything away, just be just with what is. But keep coming back to what you are directly experiencing in this moment. If your mind takes you on a train of thought, when you notice that, just come back and experience the floor under your feet or the air on your cheek or the presence of the person next to you. Letting your mind not hold on to things, but just be. Thoughts arising, passing away. Noticing which sensations present themselves to you. The horn, feeling in your leg, maybe an agitation, perhaps it's a memory, or it's a judgment about yourself or about something else. Just notice it and be with it. And let it stay or go as it chooses. Noticing if the siren comes into your consciousness, let it be there. Don't resist it, don't grab hold of it. 
It comes and it goes. Notice that what you were noticing as much as two minutes ago is already gone. Thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories, plans. Crossing your awareness like clouds cross the heavens. Clinging to nothing, just being at rest with what is. there is agitation, just notice agitation. Whatever state of mind, whatever feeling, or thought, or sensation, neither clinging to it nor pushing it away. Just coexist with all of it. Just be with it just as it is. There's nowhere to go, there's nothing to accomplish. There's no merit. It's just this. Just this. Feel the awareness as a vast ground like the sky. And all of the thoughts and sensations and memories and plans and qualities of mind and judging as clouds that come from who knows where and go who knows where. Identify for a moment with the vast sky. This vast presence, it hears everything, and yet there is no effort. It's not doing anything, it's just being. How little time we acknowledge that in us which is just being. Quite wonderful, Justin. Really. The way you've presented Ramdas and Alan Watts is uh through this music is exceptional. Actually Justin kicked off what we have been doing 
uh, with our Soul Land series with Ramdas, and he kicked it off with w- what Mark has been doing with uh, Alan's words and music. So you are the OG of <laughs> <laughs> of this genre. Thank you, uh, and I'm I'm happy that this this stuff is so easy to spread right now. You can get all of these. Just search for superposition. Oh, uh, superposition, Alan Watts, Ramdas, anywhere you you can listen to music, and it's all there. It's available. Yeah. Hibernations have been very good. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. And the visual is very, uh, very soft, very nice too. I like I like what you did this time. Mm, yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I somehow had a technical difficulty and jumped off, but I'm back, and I just wanted okay. <laughs> to say, um, just like, first of all, that piece was amazing, so incredibly heart opening and brilliant, um, and just this like sense I got when I was listening of like talk about sharing gifts right like what a gift that you're giving to so many people through that piece and what a gift to be here tonight um with you ragu with you mark and the gift of these incredible teachers um and this community like it really just it feels inspiring and um unique Mm. and special and i'm glad that we can do it and i'm glad that we can provide a space for people to come together and that we're you know, have a journey ahead of us for those who want to join. Yeah. So. Give them the URL again. <laughs> Ramdas.org slash Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A. Thanks, um, Jackie. <laughs> yeah. And thank you all so, so much. It really has been an honor. And yeah. um, look forward to seeing you all soon. Yeah. Be well. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, everyone. Namaste. Namaste.